Okay, so uh, welcome to session three for Ignite Scorch. Um, so today we're going to be talking about JavaScript and we're going to talk about using uh, other people's JavaScript packages as well. Um, so slides can be found on the website and then the exercise files will be on the um, same repo as before. One thing to keep in mind, some of the exercises from today will be from last time, uh, just because we didn't do all the stuff from last time. So we're just going to go over that again. But before that, uh, there's just a quick question with uh, what's the layout with the code that we provided here. Yeah, I think we got most people answering there. Um, so in this case, it is B. So um, when you're taking a look at this, the call that you can see here, um, these three columns basically don't change any of their sizes as you shrink it down. It'll just stay at three columns um, as far as it can go. Uh, from there, you then have the second row at the bottom here, which then has the column large six and then medium 12. So it's large. Uh, whenever the screen is large, it will be 50-50. Um, and then when you get small, it'll go straight the way down to... Um, Sorry, to medium, then it'll go straight the way across to full width. Okay, so last week we talked about JavaScript. Um, so just as a quick review, it's basically a language that runs once the page is actually loaded on the browser, and it will let you interact with elements on the page as well as the browser to manipulate them. Uh, it's its own language, and it can work with either an inline tag or you can have a script tag or uh, importing a file. <laughs> So just going through the syntax basics again. Uh, so you should try and enter lines with a, a semicolon. This isn't actually necessarily hard required, but I would recommend getting in the habit of it because it's um, some some browsers like having the semicolon, some of them don't. So really old browsers will probably want you to do this. Uh, curly braces are used inside the functions. Uh, it's the same thing with any sort of um, if statement, anything like that. Um, just be careful because they're also used to create JSON objects, which is basically the same thing as like a dictionary in Python. So um, if you haven't heard that concept before, basically, I just call them the squigglies. Uh, but essentially, what you have is you have a statement in Python normally, and then you have a colon, and then you have an indent line, and then you have whatever the body of that statement is. So with a function, you have whatever the actual function definition is here. Then you have the body of the function inside here. Uh, with a conditional, you have the if statement at the top here, and then you have the actual thing that will happen when the condition happens. And for with a loop, you basically have the actual loop statement and then indented from there. Same idea, except for it just lives between squiggly braces. Uh, and so the indentation itself doesn't actually matter. Um, you can change up the indentation with JavaScript and it still works completely fine. Um, the thing that actually matters is that it's inside those quickly braces. Whatever is inside those quickly braces is considered the body. And that's all there is to it. Um, so basic data types are essentially the same as um, <clears throat> Python. Uh, they're a little bit different with uh, how like some of the methods and stuff all work, but they're basically the same idea. Uh, the only one that's kind of new is this JSON, which is something that'll be used a whole bunch, which is basically the same as a dictionary in Python, which I think is covered in Flare. Um, so basically, you just have a name. Whenever you type in JSON of name, then you'll get Kieran as a response, or JSON of age, then you'll get uh, 23 as a response. Uh, and if you do need to change um, strings to integers or to floats, you can do it just with parse int or parse floats, and then you just pass the string, essentially. Um, so yes, yeah, so there's three different types of loops um, for each, which is the Python style, which will basically go through and like this previous example up here, where we have like shopping shopping list, um, the for each loop will basically go through and it will give you each of the items out of this list as you go. So for const element of array would basically give you each of the items as you're going. So we can see right here, this is the value up here. So the first one element would be equal to one. Then the second loop, the element would be two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. C style is basically, it just says start at zero right here. And then it says go from zero until you hit the array dot length. So essentially the length of this whole array and the whole time add one to it, basically. So a little bit different than Python, but very, pretty similar idea. Uh, and then a while loop is basically just a while loop, same thing. 
as it is in Python. Uh, so for each first four, so like I was saying before, you have two options uh, in JS to try and iterate through an array. You have this C style right here where you do an index and then you're basically going through here. So this is basically be console.log, which is the same thing as print in JavaScript. Um, and it's basically saying shopping list of index. So this would be shopping list of zero for the first loop, then one, then two, then three, which would then go through, sorry, then one, then two, which would then go through. And you'd have shopping list of zero, which is eggs, which will get printed. Then you have shopping list of one, which is ham, which get printed. Then shopping list of two, which is spam, get printed. And then at that point, the index would be larger than the shopping list. So, uh, and then the other option is this down here, which is a little bit uglier, but basically it's saying for each item, you can basically do some stuff inside here, which is console.log the item. Uh, when in doubt, let it generate. So basically anything that you're doing with JavaScript, um, VS Code is basically built for JavaScript essentially. So you never have to memorize these things. You can just type in four and hit enter and you'll get the full for loop syntax. So you never have to like feel like you have to try and memorize this stuff. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the type hinting stuff is really good in JavaScript. So just make sure that you are using VS Code properly when you're going through. Uh, conditions are basically the same as they are in Python as well. The only difference is that there are two different types of equals and it's kind of a pain. Um, one of them will check if the value is the same and it will try to convert the value. So if you have uh, X as a five, which is an integer here, and then you have XS5, which is a string. It'll try to convert the string to an integer and then compare them. Whereas this three is basically a more strict comparison. Other than that, every other symbol is basically the exact same as it is in Python. Um, the only one that is different uh, in JavaScript is that instead of using uh, the regular and, so when we go, let me just pop this open. Let me just open up day three. When we're looking at JavaScript and we have an and statement that we want to make, normally, just steal this for a second. So if I go ahead and pop up my script tag here. Um, normally in Python, if you have something, you have like a true and, or sorry, true and false, something like that. So you'd have like an and statement in between here. The and is just replaced by two and symbols. So that is and, and two lines is or. So instead of saying and and or, you just say that. So you say if, uh, if true and false, which wouldn't ever work, but, um, if x and y, for example, like that. So that's how you just do an and statement. And then if you want to do or, it's two lines instead of typing out and and or. Okay. So. Now, accessing data on the page. So basically, there's two different available objects that you can modify in the browser. So there's a document object and there's a window object. The document object is basically where all the elements are. It lets you add, remove, update them, full screen the page, do all that sort of stuff, all the cool stuff that's actually built into sort of like the area that most people look at. And there's the window object, which is basically the actual browser itself. So that gives you browser state, gives you information about the internal databases, all the stuff that's sort of stored directly in the browser, all of that stored inside of the window object instead. So... Basically, when you're looking at the browser, this top bit here with all your bookmarks and all the URL and everything, all that sort of stuff at the very top here, that's basically going to be considered your browser. And then, then sort of everything is inside that. And then the area that you actually see after that, which is where the actual content is for the page, that would be sort of a document. And that's vaguely sort of an easy way of thinking about where different pieces are, is just to think about it that way. So the window object has a ton of stuff. Um, one of the most useful things about the window objects is dealing with the URL. So window.location is the URL. And so essentially, this is just an object. So when we're taking a look, for example, at the Scorch site, or yeah, the, uh, the Ignite site here, uh, if I go ahead and I just type in window, then you can see here, when we look at this, this is just like a window object, essentially. So if I go ahead and do window.location, I go ahead and hit enter, you see there's a whole bunch of stuff that's in here. Uh, I'll actually make this a little bit bigger. So window.location um, works super well. If I go window.location.href, you can see here, this is the URL that we're currently on. And so the way that most JavaScript stuff works is that there essentially are objects. You change the state of those objects to make anything happen. So if I wanted to, for example, send somebody to a different page, I would reset this value of the window for it to go and um, change the page. So if I set this instead to HTTPS colon slash slash google.ca like that, hit enter, that's how you do something like a redirect because it basically just sent me to this page. So most of the things that you'll want to do in JavaScript will be manipulating objects. And that's most of the stuff that you're like pretty much anything you're going to be dealing with in JavaScript is going to be just basically messing around with different objects. Um, another thing you can use the window for is the size of the screen. So you can get the inner height and the outer height. Outer height is kind of useless. Um, you can use it for stuff, but it's not really recommended. Uh, obviously, most of the stuff that you're going to be doing and you're going to be trying to do calculations for are going to be uh, based on whatever the people, whatever people are actually looking at as far as the content goes. 
So using the outer height, which includes the like bookmarks bar and all that stuff is kind of useless. Um, so instead just use the inner width and inner height if you want that. Uh, this is the stuff that you can do. If you're interested, you can take a look at that. That's database stuff that you can do with the window object. But then the other one that's more important is the document object, which you'll be using a whole bunch. This is how you mess around with elements on the page. So as we've seen before um, in HTML, we have the elements that exist. So we have things like if I go ahead and just inside the HTML tag here, if I go ahead and add in like an anchor tag, for example, we have the element itself, We have uh, which is all of this. We then have like the start tag, the end tag, the attributes, and the inner content, which is what we've seen before. The reason that I called all of it that stuff is because that's exactly what it is in JavaScript. That's exactly what all the names of everything are in JavaScript as well. So when we're taking a look at this, uh, this anchor element, for example, in this case, would be a HTML element class that would have an attribute of href, and it would have a um, like a dot inner HTML essentially. And when you're looking at this, there is a spec that has all of the different things that you can do with HTML elements. As you can imagine, there's a whole bunch of things that you can do. So we're going to cover a small percentage of them. Things that are actually kind of useful, but there. Mm -hmm there's a whole bunch you can do. The first thing that we need to do is find elements. So we can find them a whole bunch of different ways. Uh, the main one, so when I was saying before that IDs are super useful, this is why, because you can just do document.getElementById and then put in whatever ID you want and you'll be able to find it. So this is why if I have something like this and I put in an ID, get it equal to um, like opening link or something like that. All I would do is inside my script tag, I could do document.get element by ID, and then I could do this. And now I have that element right here as an object that I can then mess around with. So then if I want to get the href of this, I can just do .href like that, and then I can get the information that's available in the attributes. So that's how most of JavaScript works. There's other ways of finding class, uh, finding elements. You can do it by class name, but then that will give you all of the, everything else that has an S here. So you see that element is only for uh, ID right here everything else has elements, that's because they all return arrays that you have to go through. So there's only one, if you're looking by class name, for example, like if C, if the class has dark on it, um, then you'd have to go through and check that list to find which element you actually want, essentially. Uh, so like I was saying before, tons of data you can get from elements, you can get their uh, tag name, you can get their inner text, their inner HTML, you can also get their attributes, like I just showed you before. Um, you can change all of these except for the tag name. That's the only one that you can't change. Uh, if you want to make a new tag, you have to create an actual new tag and then go from there if you want to change the tag name. Um, but like, for example, if I want to get the, if I go on, let's say they should be a nice site on here, and I take a look at uh, other ends or anything with an ID. There's nothing with an ID. That's very annoying. Let's try the blog. I'm sure there's something with an ID on here. ID equals something. Uh, that does not have an ID. Okay, can't find anything with an ID. That's kind of annoying. Oh, there it is right here. Um, so if I just go ahead and grab this, for example, then what I can do is I can open up the console and I can do documents.get element by ID. Type in the ID. And hit enter, and you can see here this is the H2, uh, which is for this right here. And if I went ahead and I did that, and I said dot inner text, and I made it equal to hello. Then you can see here now it's changed to hello. So let me just zoom that in. So you can see here document dot get element by ID typed in the ID, and then I just say dot inner text equal to hello, and it changed it on the page. <clears throat> so basically, all of the state of every element on the page is stored in an object somewhere. Uh, so updating the element object, like I was saying before, you can update it however you want. Uh, the inner text that I just showed you there is probably a bad way to do it. Uh, you almost always want to use inner HTML because inner HTML will let you put other HTML tags in there and it'll deal with it for you. If you put other HTML tags in there, when you do inner text, it will completely ignore them. So pretty much always, if you want to modify the contents of an, an element, always just change the inner HTML instead of the inner text. Okay, so this uh, exercise is actually going to be in the day two folder. Uh, so if we go to the day two folder, and then we go into uh, exercises, there is an exercise called button, what's it called? Button text starter. So it's right here. Uh, and this is the one that you're going to take a look at. Basically, what you're going to do is there is some text that says, hello world. And what you can do is those button, um, those buttons that I was talking about earlier uh, in the last session, if we have a function, like let's say a function that I call like add, and then we say X and Y. What we can do with a button is we can say button, and then one of the attributes we can add to it is called onClick. And this onClick can call a JavaScript function. So we can say add one, two, 
And then let's say this is just console.log one. Um, and what this will do is that anytime somebody clicks this button, it'll run this function. So if we actually pop open that HTML and take a look, there should be a button in here. You're basically going to want to use the on click to try and run um, the update text here and then just change the rest of the function so that it actually changes the text from hello world to goodbye world. Okay, we'll give you guys a little bit of time to try that out. Now that everybody's back in here. Um, so for this one, so this is like the what we had normally um, when we first started. So I'm going to try and click it. It's not doing anything. Um, and so in here, the big thing is that we have the ID and we already have this line right here that's basically grabbing that, um, that element itself. So all we need to do with that is just say text dot inner HTML is equal to, I think it was goodbye world was what we're looking for. And now that's great. We can go ahead, refresh, and when we try and hit it, it doesn't do anything. Uh, if we actually wanted to run this just from uh, for any debugging, okay, I don't know why my thing is so large, uh, but if you ever want to just debug it and just see what happens, you can actually run your functions directly inside the console in the browser as well. Uh, so we can just run update text like this, see if it works. It does work. Okay, so now we just need to get to work on here, which we can go through and just add an attribute to the button. So on click equals update text. Just like that. Now if we refresh and click it. Oh, hold on. Um, helps if you spell click correctly. There we go. And then now when you click it, it works. So that's how you do that one. Uh, there is another one that you can take a look at optionally if you want, which basically does the numbers. Uh, we're not going to do that one today just because we don't have quite enough time to do all the exercises that were from yesterday, from last time, sorry. Um, attribute wise, you can find out the attributes of an element and you can modify them. So you can modify them directly by just saying, um, like, whatever the element is dot and then the attribute and then change it that way. Uh, you can also check if it exists by saying dot has attributes. You can set it directly by just saying dot set attributes and you can remove it by just saying remove attribute. So pretty simple. Uh, and if you want to change uh, the CSS, there is a CSS declaration object, which is basically just a fancy name for essentially a CSS style thing that exists uh, for any elements. So if you want to change the color of anything that's in here, or you want to change any of the text sizes, anything like that, you can just do, you find the element itself, and then you do dot style. And then from there, you do whatever the actual H, the CSS attribute is. So the style itself is an attribute of the element. And then of that object, you then change the attribute. So style dot color would basically be the same thing as doing something like this in CSS, where let's say, for example, you have whatever the element is, and then you just say, or sorry, uh, star. So whatever the element is, and then you just say color, and then say so you make the color like red, like that. Uh, all that you would do in uh, HTML is you would just say, or in CSS, or JavaScript rather, is element.style.color equals red, like that. And that's basically the same pattern for everything with styles. Uh, there's also a documentation link that you can click on here that'll give you more information about that if you're interested. Uh, creating objects is awful, but if you want to know how to do it, this is how you can do it. So just heads up on that one. Uh, there's also information about how to do some other stuff in JavaScript there as well. So today what we're going to look at is trying to work on sort of a more real project. Uh, so something like building a blog site for um, coders, which is a programming company. Uh, so if I go ahead and close up. I think it's just called coder actually. No, what is it? I can see. Uh, so something like this. So essentially we come in here, there's a blog. We can see there's a whole bunch of posts in here on the blog and we can click filter by uh, different elements. And then when we click inside of one, we can see this sort of the syntax highlighting that exists for any of the code. So we're going to show you how to do all of that today. So the first thing is to talk about JavaScript packages. So until now, we have been using just regular JS files. Uh, and that's sort of the simplest uh, JavaScript package that you can use. Um, but now let's talk about using other people's JavaScript files. So I've gone ahead and written a modified form of a filtering system that's basically used for doing the filtering that you saw before. And so what we can do to import something like that is with the scripts tag, which is where we've been putting all of our uh, JavaScript so far, what we can do is we can say script. And then if you look here, there is an abbreviation for source. If we click on that, you can see here, there's a source. So this is basically the same thing as like an image where you then give it like the location of whatever file you want to load. And then it basically replaces everything inside the script tag with whatever file you provide. So um, Looking at day three in the exercises in the filtering section, there is a filtering.js file. You can find it here. Um, basically what it does uh, in a nutshell for people who are interested is it basically just adds in a, um, 
it just changes the classes of the CSS to say show or hide when you click on one of the filters. That's basically what it's doing. Um, and so there is some documentation that talks about how it works inside here. So this is a markdown file, like I was saying in the first session. So when you're in here, what you can do is you just press control shift and V or command shift V on a Mac, and it'll give you all of the documentation for how the system works. So it'll give you all the information about how it works in here. And what you're going to do is, um, for this, this is also just some tips for picking other people's projects uh, that you want to use. Just don't pick a random person's because sometimes they won't be very good. Um, but the exercise that you're going to do is basically just trying to, um, we already have some filters that are built in to the code. So when we're taking a look at this code right here, there are already some filters that are here and uh, there's already some stuff that's in here. Um, so what you're going to do is you're just going to make the uh, filters actually work from there. So um, give you guys a chance to try that out. People are just joining back in now. So um, yeah, so I think the Rust example was already done in here. So this is the code that was here before, um, which just had this data filter here for Rust. Um, so it's just a matter of adding in the other data filters there, and then just adding the data filters to the things that you for each of the posts essentially. And then just come in here, it'll just pop up like that. So. <clears throat> One of the things that's important, um, mostly when looking at JavaScript, is that a lot of the stuff that you're trying to do, if you break it down, um, can be a lot easier to um, sort of see. So in this case, all that we're doing with these data filters is we're just giving a way for essentially the JavaScript to highlight one of these um, posts and then change the classes that are available on it. That's all this package basically does. So <clears throat> oftentimes, packages can be kind of simple like that. Uh, a lot of the filtering stuff, I think this is less than like 40 lines of JavaScript to get it to work. Um, but what happens when you have sort of larger packages? Um, so package managers exist for basically any language, uh, for most languages, I should say. Uh, so pip in Python, if you use that before, I think we used Pygame before. So uh, if you had to pip install anything, uh, we did it at the beginning of the course with EasyCV to install that. Um, so JavaScript has one called NPM. Uh, we're not going to talk about it too much, but it basically does a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, it's included with what's called Node.js. So um, if you're interested in that, you can take a look at that on your own. Uh, there's some resources right here. But NPM kind of sucks to use a lot of the times, uh, mostly just because when you install stuff from NPM, it oftentimes has a whole bunch of other stuff it brings with it. Uh, sometimes you can have like 300 dependencies by just installing one package. So uh, the question is, how do we just get something up and running super quick that we just need to get going? Um, well, some packages will work just as regular files. And what you can do with those is what's called a CDN. So a CDN is essentially just a server that exists somewhere. And all it exists to do is just give you files. So when you ask it for a file, it'll just give you a file. It's all it's for. Um, it's basically designed to be optimized for doing that. They put them all over the country, all over like different countries and everything like that to make it so that you can distribute stuff really easily. This is how things like Netflix work to get videos faster to you or uh, images from like whatever, like Instagram, stuff like that. They basically all use these CDNs. <clears throat> what we can use them for is for JavaScript. Essentially, there are a ton of CDNs that exist for JavaScript, which basically take packages that have already been built for you, and they'll just put them on the web for you. So uh, there's an article here if you're interested about some interesting security stuff with that. Um, but Thanks. basically, the uh, basically what we're going to look at is just using libraries. So there's no one size fits all ways to learn libraries. There's different ways of doing it. Uh, you can go through the docs, you can go through YouTube videos, you can go through blog posts, whatever. The ones that we've picked for this, we will include some of the documentation that you'll need to know instead of having to go and search for it yourself. But if you get the chance to go through and read the documentation for the packages that we're going to be using, because um, it'll be handy in the future as a skill. So highlight.js is a syntax highlighting library, which will basically go through and it'll highlight code the same way that you see it in VS Code. This can be handy if you're writing blog posts because it makes it easier to understand what's going on in the code. So why not just use CSS? Uh, well, the problem is that there are different things when you're looking at code. Like for example, this from statement here, this is all Python code. Uh, the from statement you can see at the bottom here is differently colored than any of the other stuff that's in here. So you can't really just use CSS to change it because you have to manually change each of the colors of every sub, um, like specific spot essentially. And so what highlight.js does for us is it basically generates all that uh, for us, basically. Like it'll just go through, it'll read all of the text that you have inside of certain uh, HTML elements read it as code, read it as whatever language you give it, and then it'll highlight it for you with some CSS. 
So to get the code, uh, if we're looking at their docs, we can go ahead and pop it open. You can see here at the top, there's basically just some information about how to include it. You basically just use a script tag and you include the CSS that they include as well. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to use what's called a, a CDN. So there is a list of available files right here from CDN.js is the place that we're grabbing it from. But essentially, this top link we can see here with the .js, this is the actual highlight.js file. And then any of the ones down here that have CSS, when we start scrolling down, uh, are all themes. So like this, for example, is a theme for um, highlight.js. So all we need to do is basically grab the JS file, grab the CSS, and then we can start working with it. So to install it on a page, uh, there is a um, there's a file inside of exercises under highlight.js for starter exercise. So it's available right here. So day three, exercises, highlight.js. And there is a starter file right here, which includes the just sort of a basic page that has just the file sort of set up for you. So it includes the style sheet, and it includes the uh, JavaScript in, uh, installed for you from a URL, basically. Now, the question is, how do we actually add code? Well, so for code, what we need is we need two different uh, HTML elements. We need a pre and we need a code. And then we need to add a class to it. So we can see here we have a pre. What this does is it lets you maintain uh, like tabs and spaces, which is handy for Python. Um, it basically just pre elements can be used without code elements if you want to. But that's basically what it mostly does is it just makes it so that everything is sort of respected. Whereas the code element is what will actually do the actual highlighting. And what you do is you add a class and they say language dash and then whatever the language name is. And then from there, highlight.js with its JavaScript will go through, find everything that has this class on it and it'll highlight it for you. So once you've actually highlighted everything, once, you, once it's like found everything, what you need to do is add an additional script tag to it that will then actually activate the highlighting. So once you, once you have it installed on a page, if we take a look at uh, do, 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 highlight JS on the starter. We have it basically set up here. And then you can see here we have highlight all. And this is because when this code gets brought in, it creates an object called H, uh, H1JS. And then we have to tell it to actually highlight everything. So inside here, uh, what we're going to do for, um, okay, well, one, one thing before that is uh, escaping, which is something that we'll talk about a little bit later as well. But essentially, because we're working in HTML, you can imagine if we tried to do some HTML code in here. So if we did something like uh, pre, and then we did code. And then we put some put some HTML in here. You can see here if I go like H1 or H2 like this and then start typing stuff, how does the browser actually know that this isn't supposed to be read just as regular HTML? And so that's where what's called escaping comes in. So what we can do in the browser is we can do these little character keys here that'll basically give us the same characters, but without the problems that we're running into. So if we go and LT like that, if you hover over it, you'll see here, it says a character representing the left bracket. So especially for anything to do with HTML or JavaScript, you need to be careful and make sure you do that. Otherwise, you'll run into problems when it loads on the page. So the exercise that you have uh, for now is here is some code uh, right here. So you can just copy the code directly from the slides. What you're going to want to do is basically dump the code, take the code, just highlight it, dump it in here. And now get it to work with the highlight, the syntax highlighting. So essentially, just go through and um, fix this so that it shows up properly. And uh, it should look something like this image you see right here at the bottom. So you guys a chance to try that out. Okay. I think people are joining back in now. Um, so yeah, so basically when we're taking a look at this, if we just have the regular page, how we would just copy paste it, you can see here, nothing shows up. So what we need to do is that escaping. So uh, I'm going to be kind of lazy and I can just, if you highlight it and press control F, you can find this one and then you can just sort of replace as you go. So if I go ahead and replace those, uh, you should really replace both of these, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to replace one. And then if we refresh, we can see here, it works properly. Um, the reason why this is important uh, is that that escaping stuff happens actually quite often. Uh, if anybody has ever heard of TweetDeck before, uh, TweetDeck was a Twitter platform that existed before. And the reason I say it existed is because they got shut down. Uh, they ended up costing people millions of dollars because they didn't do any of this. And so people could just run whatever code they wanted by tweeting at people. So every time anybody tweeted something at somebody with any code in it, it would just run on their browser. So uh, that escaping stuff comes up quite a bit. So just keep that in mind whenever you're looking at anything that's sort of going to be reading um, files like that. Okay, uh, and so with highlight.js, you can also change the theme. 
Uh, so basically changing the theme is just a matter of changing the CSS uh, file that's loaded. And then you can also add extra languages by just sort of chucking in um, a additional JS file. So in the interest of time, uh, I'm just going to just quickly run through this exercise uh, just because I want to get to the next part of this. So um, essentially inside the highlight.js file itself, there's this Docker exercise that's in here. And you can see here there is the Docker file is sort of the thing that's popping up. So if I go ahead and pop this open into the browser, we can see this is what it looks like right now. And if we actually it'll pop open the Chrome tools, we can see here it says could not find uh, a module to load this. So what we can do is we can actually head to the links that we had before. So if we go ahead, take a look at the, uh, oops, sorry, uh, take a look at the CDNJS stuff from before. We can just go in and we could find the Docker file uh, location here. We go ahead, copy this tag. And that'll give us the JavaScript, which will actually do the highlighting for us. So that's basically just adding in the extra language. And then if we want to change the theme, uh, we could go through and we could find the theme in the list. I happen to know that all we need to do is just change this to VS 2015. Come back here. And I lost my window. So we'll open this back up. Uh, oh, sorry. Maybe did I put the wrong thing in here? Maybe VS 2015. Um, do, 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 do. Yes. Ah, there it is. 2015.min. Yes, 2015.min.success. Yep. And we'll refresh. Answer to go. Essentially, the main point of this is that whenever you're dealing with JavaScript files, oftentimes people will split stuff up with different features. And so when you're looking for those features, if you read their documentation, they usually tell you how to install those features separately. So just keep that in mind whenever you're looking at it. For highlight.js, it's pretty easy. You just slap in some extra files and you're good to go. Um, okay. Now, this is sort of where it gets more interesting. So what you see is what you get. Editors uh, are super common. They're basically used to take any text that you have. Um, so you can see here in this comment section down here, we can type stuff in and we can go through and we can format that content as we go. Um, there are a ton of different types. Uh, single pane, block-based form, document-based, all that sort of stuff. Um, single pane is sort of the classic one that you see when you just sort of type some stuff in. It's on Reddit, Slack, anything like that. We'll use those. Uh, forms is just an HTML form. Uh, super easy to do. Document-based is kind of like Google Sheets. But the one that we're going to be talking about today is a newer one that's a little bit fancier called uh, a block-based editor. So editor.js is the thing that we're going to be talking about today. And the way that this works is that each sort of piece of content, instead of just being sort of like one big chunk that just has your content inside of it, um, what, what block-based systems do is they put everything into little blocks. So they're basically blocks of content that then have a certain type about them. So to install editor.js, you can just grab it from the script uh, from a CDN. Uh, alternatively, inside the actual editor.js files here, we actually have the JS downloaded right here as editor.js. So you can import it from there, or you can go and grab it from the CDN. It doesn't really matter. They both do the same thing. They're just loading the JavaScript file. So um, to start using editor.js, you basically import the, uh, CSS, or the JS, and then you have a div called editor.js that has like an ID. And then inside a script tag, you basically create a new object that will then look for that ID that you provided. So in this case, we're saying editor.js is the ID we want, and then we're going to go and grab it. Uh, this is available for you under editor.js, and that's the starter exercise. So editor.js, and then under the starter exercise right here, we can see uh, we have a thing that's set up to do that. So basically, it's loading the JavaScript file, and it's creating a new editor.js, and then it's just saying that the actual ID that we need is right here. And you can see here the way this works is that this is creating a JSON object like we saw before, uh, and then it's just basically putting in keys as it goes. So that's basically just a key of a string, and then it's passing the editor disk to it. Um, yeah, and so if we actually pop open this in a window, this is basically what it looks like. So there's a little thing right here, a little plus. We can start typing stuff as we go. And we can type in, and we can add in, and you can see here there's like these little blocks, and you can move them up and down. You can remove them. You can do all this stuff all from basically two or three lines of JavaScript. So that's all great. But question is, what do we? how do we actually use it more uh, like to do something instead of just showing up and typing stuff in? So the way this works, let me actually just grab this and I'll make it do it this way so it's a little bit easier to see. So we can say here config, and then we can say is equal to this. And you can see here, this is just a JSON object, and then we can just pass config into here. So that's basically what's going on here. It's creating a... Um, 
JSON object that has a holder as one of its keys, and then it has uh, editor JS as the value here. And that's basically what tells it to look for this ID. So basically, it's just saying, go find this ID inside this div. And then when you find that ID, you're going to set up the editor JS object inside that div. And so if we go ahead and pop this open in the Chrome tools, we can see exactly what it's done. So inside of editor JS, if we go ahead and you can see there's a div that we had, we can see it's just filled it with a whole bunch of stuff. And so that's basically how this works. It just creates all the elements that it would need to be able to work from there. Okay, there are other things that you can add to the config. Uh, there's actually a list, I'll click on this. Uh, one of the main ones is tools. So there are a whole bunch of these different tools. And what tools do is when you're clicking the little plus here, hold on, when you click the little plus, you can see here this text thing pops up. You can add in extra ones. So you can add in whatever ones for different content you want. So if you want to add in, like being able to add in like code, uh, any sort of like layouts, anything like that, you want to add in like uh, images, links, uh, like a checklist. Uh, if we go ahead and pop this open, we can see here kind of what it does. You can make these sorts of checklists inside of there as well. So there's a whole bunch of things that you can put in there. The way that it works is like similar to highlight.js. You basically go, you find the script for that, uh, for that particular tool that you want, bring that in. And then what you do inside the config is there's another key inside the config called tools. And inside that tools config, you basically just pass it the tools that you want. So if you had something that you had installed called header, uh, you could just go ahead and pass it that object in there as well. So it's basically an object inside of an object from there as a key. Um, there is an example of this in additional tools right here. So if we're taking a look at additional tools, we can see here, this is the example of what it looks like. So we have a header that we've imported from here that has created a header object for us. And then we're passing that into that config that we talked about before. I know there's a lot of nesting, so I apologize. It's a little bit annoying. Um, but this is how a lot, a lot of JavaScript stuff will just have these JSON objects where they just pass in configurations essentially from there. Okay, so then the question is, how do you actually process the data? <clears throat> so we've created the editor here as an object with using saying create a new editor JS. All that we do is we hit save, uh, which then sort of saves the data and it returns what's called a promise, which basically says, I'll give you the data or I'm going to throw an error. Um, promises we'll, we'll use later. Uh, they're a little bit of a pain, um, but th what they basically say is, I promise to give you the data if I have it. And if I don't, I'm going to throw an error. And that's basically what a promise does. Um, this code is always the same for every promise. And so what we actually have here is I think it's in log data. This code is done for you. What's happening here is that when you hit editor.save, it's returning that promise. And then we are using some functions called then and catch. So then is basically going to process the data for us. And everything inside of here is what's being processed. And then catch is going to basically find any errors that we have, and it's going to print them out. So in this case, it's printing out the page data here. And in this case, it's printing out the errors here. Um, I know this looks super complicated. The long and short of it is that basically this is creating a function, and then it's just using that function to solve um, the problem. So if we create this as a function outside of it, we can also pass that function and do it that way. Um, unfortunately, promises are just kind of complicated. They're kind of annoying. Um, but JavaScript uses them for a whole bunch of stuff. It's essentially a try catch block. Yeah. So you can think about it that way. Uh, essentially, this is the try. And then you can think about this as the catch, essentially. That's basically what happens. Um, the then can be used more times in a row, though, as well. So some people will have multiple then statements on top of things because some promises return other promises. So um, yeah, the most important thing with this is that when you're looking at that code, you can just basically copy the same template for everything. So dot then, and then the output data, and then do it this way. Just copy that. It's inside of the log data file here. Um, you can just grab that code whenever you need to use it for anything. Because uh, it's hard to remember sometimes to do the dot then, and then basically put all that data into this variable, and then basically pass that variable to a function that you're creating, essentially. So that can be kind of complicated. So just copy paste it when you need to. Uh, I still just copy paste it because I always forget the syntax for this. Uh, and VS Code, this is the one thing that VS Code doesn't have built in. So um, yeah, and then so the same thing that we did before that we saw earlier with being able to put it on a button, we can actually do that uh, directly on a button as well. So if we have like this function for logging the data, 
uh, that we created like this, which basically just prints everything. Then what we can do is we can put that on a button and then people can type in their content and then hit the button and then it'll console.log the data for us because it'll run the JavaScript function essentially. So log data is a file that we have in the day three folder. So there it is. Let me just quickly pull it up in here. So here's what it looks like. So we start typing some stuff in, we go ahead, we can see here now we have that heading that we talked about before. And now we can type that in, that's a little bit different. And then now if I hit F12 and I go ahead and hit submit data, you can see here, it gives me the page data. And that just gives me a JSON object with a whole bunch of stuff inside of it. Um, once we have that data, uh, it's another JSON object, like I was saying before. <clears throat> and so from there, we can get whatever information that we want. Uh, the thing that we actually care about is inside of blocks, there is an array that has the data inside of it. So um, let me quickly just show this off. So inside here, we have the regular, this is just the log data file that I was talking about. We have the output data. And then from that output data, what we can do is we can just say dot blocks like this, and that will give us just the actual content. So you can see here, when I'm looking at the page data now, there's just the two sets of blocks that we have here. So like I was saying before, everything is split up into blocks. So these are the two blocks that we have. Does anybody have any questions before I move on? Because that's a lot of information all at once. Give it five seconds for people to do that while garbage record. Nope. Okay. Um, so long and short of it, when you're looking at this log data file, what you can actually do, just you can just copy paste this file if you need to, uh, so you have a backup of it. Um, but basically, this is the sort of basic setup that you want to use for most of the other stuff that you want to do with the editor. Essentially, you have the editor. Whenever somebody fires this function, this log data function, you have the editor.save, and then it outputs the data from there, and you just go from there. Okay. So with this, what we're going to get you to do for this is using that same file that I was just showing you here. Um, what you're going to want to do is basically output the, the the data for two blocks. So essentially, you want to have two of the blocks that are there have the data be outputted. So the output data dot blocks is where you'll actually find the information, and then from there you'll want to get the first two pieces of information and just try just logging them to the console and just saying some information. Uh, as you're looking at these output blocks here, if I go ahead and I think there's actually an example. Yeah, this is what it, this is what the whole thing looks like. Um, you can see that each of them is an object in and of itself that has some data, and then it has a type with it. Um, so you can print this out however you want. Just try printing it to the console, basically. OK, we'll give you guys a chance to try that out. are back in now um so for this one um so when we're taking a look at the information here so like i said before we have the output data dot blocks and when we're taking a look at that when we go ahead and hit sub submit data uh we end up with an array of basically two items um and then inside that array uh, of two items basically each of those items has a whole bunch of information inside of it so one of the things in JavaScript that people love doing is just keep nesting a whole bunch of stuff inside of each other. Uh, the best thing that you can do is basically just take those things and try and break them down into as small pieces as possible to get the information that you need as you need it. So as we're taking a look at this, for example, we have the output data dot blocks. So we know, OK, there's a bunch of blocks. So now, OK, let's take a look at just the first block. So now we have output blocks of 0. So if I go ahead and I refresh and we do this again, then I can see here, OK, this feels more manageable. Because now output blocks of zero, I know that, okay, I have the data and I have the type. Okay, cool. So now if I want to print the data, all I need to do, I need to do data. Okay. 
and then I come back and refresh it. And now I have, okay, there's the text inside there. So annoyingly, and I have to do top data, not text. Okay. So now I know for this one, whenever I'm typing this in, okay. So now I need you to go basically into the list and then go dot data and dot text to get the information that I need. So now if I want to print the second one, then all I do is put a one here. And now when I refresh, put stuff in here and I can put stuff in here. And I go through and I get the first one and the second one, just like that. So whenever you're looking at, especially at the beginning, if I just go ahead and see where we came from, if we take a look at just the output data initially, the initial output data that we got is pretty disgusting to look at. You can see here, we come in here, we're like, oh my God, there is so much stuff inside of here. There's a whole bunch of stuff inside of it. So basically just breaking it down one piece at a time as we're looking at it to try and find the information that we need. <laughs> okay. So with that, um, there's a little bit of code that I've written in here. Uh, so if we go ahead and we take a look at the HTML conversion, the starter file here, there is this for let's. So this is the same thing that I was talking about before, where if we have something like uh, in Python, the equivalent might be something like this. Um, if I pop open the Python command line, in Python, something like we have shopping list, and we have eggs, ham spam. Then whenever we go through and do a list, we can do for item in shopping list, print item, like that. So essentially, the variable gets assigned each time as you go through. And so that's what we're doing here. We're saying, have the block be set to the output data dot blocks. So like we were looking at with this log data where we're doing zero and one, that's basically been replaced. And now we just have, okay, so what are we looking at next? So if we saw before, block.data.text was how we got the text out of something. So that was block.data, and then we can do dot text, and then I'll give you the information that you need. And then the block.type will tell you what type of block it is. <clears throat> and so uh, I'm going to quickly actually just grab this. And if you haven't seen a switch statement before, it's basically just an if statement. So what we can say instead is if block.type is equal to heading, then we would do this part. So that's all that it's doing. So it's basically just a, a loop. Uh, sorry, it's a loop that's going through each of the blocks. And then for each of those blocks, it's basically saying, based on what the block dot type is, in this case, heading, or in this case, paragraph, we're going to do something with it. So we could replace the switch statement with just some if statements instead, if we want to. Does anybody have any questions about any of that? There's a lot of code all at once. Does anybody need it one more time? Go once. Going twice. So, okay. So, uh, that code again is available for you. So, when we're looking at the HTML conversion stuff, uh, that's basically in this file right here. And so, what we're going to do is uh, one of the things that I talked about before was there's different data types that we can have on these blocks. And one of the things that ha that's handy about that is that we can use those data types to then create HTML out of it. So, when we're taking a look at uh, here, if we're looking at the heading, we can go ahead and add in a heading and we can have that stuff in there. But then if we wanted to use that information later on, how could we like convert that to HTML again if we wanted to? And so what we can do is when we're looking at this, um, there are things called template strings. Uh, in Python, people may have seen these before. It's basically if you have something like name, it's equal to Kieran. You can do something like this where you say, my name is, and then you can put in brackets like this, name. Has everybody seen this before? Variable injections in strings is the thing people have seen, yes? Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, basically we're putting variables into strings, essentially. We can do this in JavaScript as well. And the way that it works is when we're taking a look at this, we can do something like this. So you basically do these little back ticks that are called graves. It's in the top left of your keyboard underneath the escape. And what we can do is you just basically do dollar sign and then like that, and then you put whatever variable you want in here. So if we had the data for the text, for example, and this is a heading, we could do block.data.text. And then we could wrap this in h1 tags, oops, like that. And that'll give us our heading back as a heading. So we can essentially generate a string with the content that we need to be able to create HTML out of it. And if we do this in a loop, we could basically just collect all of that into, um, so we could just make the string. And then what we could do is we could say HTML plus equals whatever that is. And that'll basically just collect all the HTML from that page. So, 
I will give you guys a chance to basically try that. That's the next exercise. So that'll be available in HTML conversions. Let's give that shot. Okay, I think everybody is back in here. Um, so yeah, basically with that one, you just have HTML, add to the HTML as you go with whatever the content is that you want to add in there, basically. Um, you could fundamentally do this with whatever you want. Uh, it's basically just a way of just building out a file step-by-step, -step, essentially. Uh, once you have that string, uh, there is a system called file saver. Uh, basically, you can import it and then create what's called a blob. Um, the blob basically... Um, we will talk about what it's actually doing in session five, I think, um, what the actual, the stuff that it's showing up with, but let me just file saver. There it is. So if I pop open this code, you can see here, there is this type thing that shows up here. So we'll talk about that in uh, session five when we talk about networking. Um, but then basically what it's doing is it's taking in the HTML that you provide it right here. And then it's just going through and saving a file. So all it does is this blob is basically just another name for a file. So when you actually load a file in a browser, like for a form, and you load it through like a form field, it'll actually load up as a blob, essentially. And then that's stored te temporarily on the browser while it's doing it. So that's basically what this does. And so that's why you have to have this thing here that says text, HTML, all this stuff, because it tells it what file type it is, essentially. Uh, and then you put the content in here, and it just basically saves it, the person's desktop. And that's all that does. Um, so... Same thing that we were looking at uh, before, where we have just a CDN. We're basically just downloading the JavaScript file from somewhere else. That JavaScript file is having the complexity for us. And then we're just doing this function call, essentially. But with those pieces that we've had, essentially, so the ability to filter blog posts, the ability to syntax highlight, the ability to write new pages in JavaScript, and then the ability to save those pages out as a file, um, we now basically have the ability to create essentially a blog from scratch. We can have a blog that we can use then write other like sites from there. So uh, I'm going to skip the exercise just because of um, just time-wise. Um, but like if we take a look at a more implemented example of this, uh, essentially if we take a look at this creative page, that's basically what this does. We have, so, we have some text here. So we have a title, we have a description, we type all that stuff in. And then all it does is this one has a whole bunch more tools implemented with it. So messing around with getting more tools in there. And then when we hit save the HTML file that basically you runs through file saver and then it creates a new page that has formatting pre-built for us. And that's all it is. Everything that we looked at today is basically the way that you can do to generate that file. Now, generating any type of file is a problem, but HTML especially is a problem um, just because when you're, as you can probably imagine, the people who created editor.js are quite clever. So why didn't they just export it as HTML in the first place? Um, well, it's because there's a whole bunch of vulnerabilities if you do that. Um, so we saw before what happens if you have uh, a situation where you put in regular HTML without escaping it. Uh, it doesn't read it as text. It reads it as code. And that causes a whole bunch of things. There's a bunch of videos here that are listed with uh, ways that people have used this in the past to basically have exploits. But here's a really cool example. There is a file inside the examples called vulnerable.js. And this has, uh, in session seven, we're actually going to look at a whole bunch of other ones that you can do as well. But basically, this one uses uh, an image. And so basically, what happens is that uh, if you cause an error, as we had that on-click stuff that we were looking at earlier today with buttons, you can actually do the same thing with errors. So you can have, the, you can have a page load JavaScript when an error happens. And so what this does is when that happens, it pops up the little window that happens there. But what people used to do uh, on TweetDeck, like I was talking about before, um, for example, is whenever the image would error, it would send them their password. So it would get their password and send it to another server, essentially. And so that's why it's really dangerous when you're bringing in any stuff that you're just going to load from user-generated content is because of the fact that they can just do stuff like this. So you want to be really careful when you're loading and saving stuff out like that. Um, so there's tons and tons of other packages. There is there is There are so many. God, there are so many NPM packages. Um, so you can take a look at those um, in your, whenever you want. Um, and the last thing I'm going to really quickly talk about uh, today is the different parts of a site. So essentially, all that we've been talking about so far is what's called the front end. Uh, that's basically everything that you see, everything that people interact with. But then the question is, okay, well, how does like Instagram keep my like images up after I like log off, for example? How does that actually happen? 
<clears throat> so the front end is great, but then there's also a thing called the back end. This is basically a server that will run somewhere. This is some, some computer somewhere that runs, and that's what's called the host. And then the client is what your front end is sort of connecting to. So this is what actually sends you the files normally. This is what sends you all the information, all that sort of stuff comes from the back end. So this is a very rule of thumb sort of information about it, but sort of uh, the front end loads in the browser, JS, HTML, CSS, back end, any language, runs on a server, does a whole bunch of different things. Uh, these aren't hard and fast rules. These change, um, and they can change based on context as well. So uh, with that, I um, next time we're going to talk about different categories of sites, and we're going to talk about all of that. Um, we're going to actually look at using what's called a static site generator. So we're going to be doing the same sort of idea that we talked about today, but in an easier manner. Uh, and it will allow us to basically create websites much more easily and much more quickly. Um, you do optionally, there is one extra exercise. I'm not going to have time to do it today. Um, and there is the end of session exercise, which is basically going to be um, looking at just adding interactivity to some pages. Um, so one of them is taking the coder blog and then making some changes to add a couple of packages that exist on there. Um, second one is creating your own uh, personal site and then using some JavaScript files. And the third one is trying to create a site similar to what we did with coder, but for animals instead. So you fill out a little form and then basically from there, you get animals. So um, that's all from me. There is going to be a presentation after this. Uh, if anybody who's interested, uh, it's going to be from the SOAR team. And I'll let Abu take over from here to talk about it. Wonderful. Thanks, Green. Um, 